In this video, we're going to learn how C Sharp delegates work and how they're used. We're going to see how they help us write more modular code and use callbacks to simplify our logic. Let's begin! So, delegates are a very interesting C Sharp feature. Essentially, they allow you to store a function inside of a field. This is extremely powerful in many scenarios. You've seen me use delegates whenever I use one of the function classes from my utilities. For example, on the function periodic, which triggers an action every certain amount of time, it uses a delegate to receive the function that will be triggered. So when I create the object, I pass the behavior that I want to trigger. In a previous video, I covered events, which also use a type of delegate. Normally, they use the standard event handler as the event type, and event handler is a type of delegate with a return type of void and a parameter signature of object and event arcs. So let's take a look at how delegates are defined, how they are created and assigned, and the various built-in types that make our job easier. Then we're going to look at two examples that show how delegates help keep our code clean and how they help us write more modular code. This video is made possible thanks to these awesome supporters. Go to patreon.com slash unitycodemonkey to get some perks and help keep the videos free for everyone. Delegates are defined as a function signature and return type, but without any implementation. So for example, here I am in a simple empty script, and first we define a delegate, and the way we do that is very simple. First we write the accessor, so for example, public, then we write the keyword delegate, and now we define the delegate return type and signature. So for the return type, let's keep it simple and just return void. Then we need a name, so let's call it our test delegate. And now we define the parameters that make up the delegate signature. But again, to keep it simple, let's make it no parameters at all. So there you go, here we define a delegate that returns void and takes no parameters. In here, all we're doing is defining the actual delegate type. So now we can make a field of this type. So just like any other field, let's say we make it private of type test delegate and call it our test delegate function. Now this field can be assigned with a function that matches this delegate signature. So here on start, let's say we set our test delegate function to equal something. So now we define our function. And again, make sure that it has the same signature as the delegate. So let's make it, first of all, return void. Then we give it a name. And again, no parameters. So this function declaration matches the delegate. So now here we can simply assign this function onto this delegate. And once we have assigned the delegate, we can call it as if it were a normal function. So we do test delegate function, in this case no parameter, so just parentheses. And just like that, we are calling the function that is stored within this field, which in this case is going to be this function. So let's just add a debug log here just to test. All right, so let's test and see. And yep, there's our log. So our function was correctly triggered through our delegate. Now let's make another function exactly like this one, but with different behavior. So in here, let's define another private void. And inside we have different behavior. So we're going to say a different message. And now up here, let's say we assign this function onto this delegate, then we call it, okay. And then we reassign our delegate with this function and we call the exact same delegate. Now let's test. And if there you go, we are calling the same delegate but getting two different behaviors. Delegates can also be multicast, meaning they can trigger multiple functions. So this is mainly what is used in the events. So here we set the delegate to the first function and then we do plus equals our second function and then we call the delegate, let's see. And yep, there you go, we just call the function once but we get our two inner function calls. So this is how the event publishers can have multiple subscribers and all of them get notified whenever the event changes. So we can add functions but then we can also remove them. So let's add both of them, we call them, then let's remove the second one and call again. And yep, there it is, the first delegate triggered both functions and the second one only triggered the first one. All right, so this is how you define a delegate and assign it to a specific function. Now, like I said, delegates can have any return type and parameters. So here, for example, we can make a public delegate. Let's make it return a Boolean. And let's say that we take an int parameter. Now we define our field of this type. And down here, we make a function that matches the signature. So we're going to return a Boolean call it something, and we're going to have an integer as our parameter. And then we can assign it the same way as previously, so my test delegate function, 
and then we can simply call it. Alright, so we assign our delete with this function and then we call it and pass in our parameters. So let's see, and if there it is, we have our function call working correctly. Awesome. Just one note here, when you define a delegate, you need to give it a name for the parameter. So if you just do int, you'll get an error. So you need to define a name for the parameter. However, when you define a delegate function, you don't actually have to use the exact same name. So here it could be something completely different. And the code still compiles, still runs, and everything's still great. Now, when it comes to creating a delegate function and assigning it, we have several ways to do it. One of the ways is how we did it just like here. So we just assign it to a function that we define that matches the signature. Now what this is actually doing in the background is we are doing a new test delegate and in this case we pass in our function. So by doing this you're explicitly creating the delegate. But again you can just keep it simple and just set it to assign the function directly which will be cast automatically. Now, another way we can create a delegate function and assign it is using anonymous methods. So here we can take our delegate, we can do equals, and then we use the keyword delegate, and we create our parameters that match the delegate parameters. So in this case, we have nothing, and then we have our function body. So just like this, we defined an anonymous method that still matches the delegate signature, and we can call it the same as any other method. There you go, there's our log working. So this is how we create a function inside of a code block. This is easier than having to create a separate function in most cases. Now another way of creating an anonymous method is with a lambda expression. Lambda expressions are great because they are extremely tiny and compact. So to do it, all you need to do is really just open the parentheses with the defined arguments. So in this case we have none. Then we do a little equals arrow and then we add our function block. And yep, that's it, it's that simple. So by doing this, we are defining our lambda expression, which works as a function that matches our delegate signature, and we can then call it. If we run the code, there it is, everything is working. So this is the easiest and most compact way of defining a function. If you've seen some of my videos, you've certainly seen me use lambdas a lot. They are extremely useful in order to keep your code simple and easy to follow. And again, both anonymous methods and lambda expressions, you can still return values. So let's use a lambda expression to define this function in here. So the signature for this delegate is it returns a boolean and contains an integer. So here for lambda expression, we open the parentheses, we define our integer, then we do our little arrow, we add the code block, and here we do simply return. So in this case, return, let's say i under five. So there you go, here we have a valid lambda expression that is going to return boolean and take an int as a parameter. If you have just a single statement, then you can actually compact this even more and just get rid of all of the curly brackets and put it just like this. There you go, this is a valid lambda expression that is going to return i under 5. If we run the code, yep, everything is working. Now, one issue with anonymous methods and lambdas is if you don't grab their references as they're created, you won't be able to remove them from the delegate manual. So for example, here I'm assigning two separate lambda expressions onto this delegate function. Then let's say we call it and then we want to remove only the first one. The way we're doing here, we can't really do that since we have no unique reference for this first function. So if you need to add and then later remove a function from delegate, then it's better to make it an actual proper function instead of using an anonymous method. Now for the built-in delegates, there are two extremely useful ones. They are both inside system, so make sure you go up and add using system. Now, the first one that you have is action, so you define it using the action type. Here is our action, and as you can see, it is a delegate that returns void and takes no parameters. So the action is pretty much a built-in type exactly of this one that we did up here. And then you also have generic versions of action that take parameters of any type. So you can define an action, and then you make it a generic, and here you can see we have tons of options. So for example, let's say an action that takes an integer and a float. So then we can assign this, and this one will take an integer and a float, and returns void. There you go, here we have an action with an int and a float. 
So for most cases, you can probably use just normal actions instead of having to directly define your delegates. Okay, so that's the built-in action type. It takes any number of defined parameters and returns void. Now, if you want to have a return value, you have the other very useful built-in type, which is the func. This one by default has a generic and the generic will be our result. So essentially our return type. So in this case, let's say we want to return just a Boolean and we give it a name. So there you go, here we have a delegate that will take no parameters and return a Boolean. So in this case, we do no parameters and we return false. So here's our func delegate. And again, here you have tons of options for any parameter types and amounts that you want. So you can define a func. The last one is always the result. So let's say we want to return Boolean, but then let's say we want to receive an integer. So just in here, we have pretty much the exact same definition that we did up here. So it returns a Boolean and it takes an integer as a parameter. So here we take an int and we return a Boolean. So just like that. All right, so here we looked a ton at how delegates can work, how we define them, how they're assigned, and the various built-in methods that make our job easier. Now that we've seen the underlying structure for how delegates work, let's look at two examples. First, let's look at an example that shows how delegates really help keep your code clean and easier to use, and then we're going to see how delegates help us write more modular code. Okay, so for example, over here I have a simple timer class, it is meant to count down the number of seconds so I can trigger some action after some time. You can see it has a function in order to set the timer. Then on update, it counts down the seconds. And then we have a function to test if the timer is complete. Then the scene, the script is simply attached to an empty game object. Then we have the game object that has the testing script we've been using. And now let's say that we want something to happen after one second. So let's use our timer script. First here in our testing, let's add a field for our action on timer. And now back in the editor, and we can just drag the reference, okay. And now here, as soon as we start, let's say we want something to happen after one second. So first we access the action on timer. In order to set our timer, let's set it to one second. So that will set the timer and start counting down. And then let's do our private void update. And on update, we need to check if the timer is elapsed. So we use that function call, is timer complete? So if it is complete, then we need to do a simple log. Okay, so just like this, it should be working. However, you can probably already see an issue. If we do it just like this, then once the timer is elapsed, it's going to trigger this function on every single frame. So let's set a Boolean to test if our timer has elapsed. So we only run this once. So if the timer has not elapsed and the timer is complete, then we set it to complete and we set it to elapse. So this will only run once. Okay, let's test. Here we are and after one second, yep, there you go, we have our timer complete. All right, so our timer worked correctly. So here we have a fully functioning timer code, but as you can see, this is extremely dirty. We're checking for the timer if it's elapsed on every single frame on this class, and we have to keep a Boolean in order to know if it's been triggered or not. So instead of the timer being handled solely by the actual timer class, the implementation of the timer is split into various places. Then if we want to use this same timer somewhere else, then we need to implement the same thing over again. So both classes are tightly coupled in a very nasty way. Now we can easily solve this problem with a simple delegate. So on the timer class, we can go up here and add using system, and then we can make use of our built-in action delegate and call our field, let's say timer callback. And now here when we set the timer, let's receive an action for our timer callback. Then we set the field to what we receive. And then on update, we do our timer complete logic. All right, so here our timer class is now much more compact and now actually is responsible for everything related to the timer. So on update, if the timer is bigger than zero, so if the timer is active, then we count it down. And after counting it down, if it is complete, then we call our callback. And now we can go back into our testing to see how we're going to use this function. And in here, instead of all of this nasty code, all we need is a reference to our timer. We don't need an update or anything like this. We just need to call setTimer, and then we pass in the timer callback. 
So again, we can use a simple lambda expression and we just do our log. So now everything is much more compact and all of the timer code is actually handled by the timer class itself. Let's see. So here we are and after one second, yep, there you go, we have our timer complete. So you can see how just by using a very simple delegate, we made our class very clean and very easy to use. So on the testing, all we do is we tell our time and the action that we want to execute after that certain amount of time. So here is a very simple timer class. This is similar to the function timer from the CodeMonkey Utilities. I covered that specific class in another dedicated video, so check that out if you want to learn more. Okay, now let's look at an example of how delegates help our code be more modular. So over here I have a simple character just moving around normally, and I can press the mouse button in order to attack. So let's look at the code. Here is the code. On our update we're handling our movement and our attack. And on the attack all we're doing is a simple input testing for the mouse button down, and if so we're calling the punch attack function. Now let's say we have an upgrade system and we want the player to graduate from punching to using a sword. So we could do that with a simple boolean. So let's say we store a private bool called is using sword and starts off as false by default. Then we could have a function called set use sword. We set our boolean to true and then here we test if we are using the sword then we use the sword attack and if not, then we use the punch attack. So this would be one valid approach, but we could also solve this problem using a delegate. So instead of storing a boolean and all of this, let's store an action, and this will be our attack function. And by default on our start, let's set the attack function to be our punch attack. So that's our default. And then when we have set use sword, instead of working with a boolean, we set our delegate to be our sword attack. And then when we're handling our inputs, we don't need to do any conditional logic in here. All we do is just access and use our delegate. So that's it. You can see how this is another potential approach. So here, just for testing, let's do a simple input. So when I press the M key, I'm going to call set use forward, which is going to modify the attack function delegate, which is then used by the attack. So let's see. So over here is my player character, move him around, and I'm attacking using punches and kicks. All right, sounds good. Now I press that key, and now I use the exact same attack, and there you go, now I'm using a sword instead. So when it comes to handling the input and the attack, both behaviors are doing the exact same thing. All we're doing is using our tech delegate, which can be pointing to whatever function we want. So for example, I've used this type of implementation in the hotkey bar video. In that video, I store a delegate for each key input, and we can easily swap out what pressing the one key does, what the two key does, and so on. All of our function behavior is stored in a field which is linked to an input. All right, so here we learned all about delegates, how they're defined, how they're assigned, and how they can be used. As you can see, having the ability to store a function in a field is extremely useful in a multitude of scenarios. Now you have one extra tool you can use to solve your problems and keep your code clean when making your games. This video is made possible thanks to these awesome supporters. Go to patreon.com slash unitycodemonkey to get some perks and help keep the videos free for everyone. As always, you can download the project files and utilities from unitycodemonkey.com. Subscribe to the channel for more Unity tutorials, post any questions you have in the comments, and I'll see you next time.